Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 308 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and a two-time author. Our second book is called From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing. So go and pick up that book today on Amazon. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, I love having guests on the show that make us think about all the things that we have in our home that might actually be bad for us, but we never knew that it was bad for us. It makes us think a little bit deeper on the things that we buy at the grocery store, just to be sure that it's safe for everybody inside. And our next guest is going to blow your mind about some of the dangers that are lurking in your own home right now. So we are going to get into it because today we have for you Emily Gold Mears. She is a citizen scientist, a research analyst, a biohacker, and an author. She's also a former attorney, but Emily shifted her advocacy efforts to seek information on optimizing one's health through extensive research analysis in science and in medicine. Her research focuses on the intersection of functional and allopathic medicine, and the critical requirements for individuals to become their own health advocates. She is actively involved in several health-related research, nonprofit organizations, as a speaker and a collaborator who is dedicated to simplifying language and educating people to live healthier and longer lives. I love it. Welcome to the show, Emily. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Of course, our audience can't wait to learn more with you today. And you know what? We get to talk about one of my favorite institutions on the planet, UC Berkeley, where you decided to go for your undergraduate experience. So tell our audience, what made you choose Berkeley? Well, when, this was a long, long time ago. <laughs> but when I went to Berkeley, I had gone to an all-girls school, a small girls school in Los Angeles. I went there from the 6th to the 12th grade. And my father actually wanted me to go to Smith College, which at the time was all girls. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. And so I think I chose something that was the actual antithesis of my experience to that point. And I loved it. I loved everything about Berkeley. It was completely different with 30,000 students, but it was really among the best years of my life. Yeah, I can totally see that. I've spoken there so many, many times and the students there are just amazing. Walking on campus, you just, you feel that energy. And uh, boy, oh boy, man, if I had to do it all over again, I think UC Berkeley would be my choice because it's just really just a fantastic institution. And you originally went to law school over at the University of Pacific, but then you shifted all of these efforts and you started getting into optimizing one's health. So what made you shift your focus from law school and being an attorney to optimizing one's health? Well, to be honest, um, I went to that law school because it was located in Sacramento, which is the capital of California. Mm -hmm. And I had an interest in politics at the time. And after I interned for the U.S. Attorney and spent three years there, I quickly changed my interest in politics. I tried practicing law for a while. I, I didn't love the practice of law. I did it. And I have great appreciation and value for the education that I got. The research skills that I learned while in law school have informed everything I've done since, even from reading the newspaper. I'm old enough that I still read the newspaper uh, physically, but um, it, it's a great education. I did not love the practice of law and I always loved science. But when I was in school, they didn't encourage women to go into science at all. And so it wasn't until after I had raised my children, I thought, okay, now is my chance. I'm going to go into science in whatever way I possibly can. Um, I particularly like public policy, which I can use my legal skills because our healthcare system is so terribly broken. And one of the factors that needs fixing is the policy decisions. They need to be changed. So I'm hoping to do that. You know, right now I'm, I'm trying to deal with my book and promote my book and help people learn what I learned along the way because they don't, you know, people don't share the information that can really optimize one's health. So. Yeah. 
I think that's a good lesson for our listeners. I mean, the college students that think that there is just a direct line to success, I think that they're going to find that there's a lot of twists and turns and valleys and hills and all kinds of different uh, directions that you're going to be thrown into. And whatever you think that you want as a college student, that might change. And it's okay. It's totally fine. Uh, you know, I went to school for accounting and clearly I am not a practicing accountant today. But those skills do really help as an entrepreneur because I can actually put together a balance sheet and an income statement and actually know if my business is successful or not. And guess what? I don't even have to hire you know, an accountant to do my taxes. I just do it myself. But I realize that there's a better way and there's a certain sense of creativity that I have that I couldn't you know, really fully use as an accountant. And so you got to change direction. And I see you've done the same and I think it's worked out really well for you. So that's great. And you know, you mentioned your book, it's called Optimizing Your Health. And in this book, you share years of research and knowledge to help other people understand how they can become their own health advocate, how they can modify their lifestyle to reduce the risk of chronic disease, and even just take a proactive role in their own healthcare. So talk to us a little bit about oral health, because you believe that oral health is actually compromising our health. How so? So lately, a great deal of tremendous discoveries have been written about the gut microbiome, but much less has been written about our first line of defense, which is the oral microbiome. And optimal health literally begins in your mouth. There is a clear two-way relationship between oral health and systemic wellness. Untreated harmful organisms that are growing out of control in one's mouth leads not only to cavities and gum disease, but also to chronic inflammation. And it's well understood that chronic inflammation is the driver of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, digestive disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, and impaired immune function. They've even found that there's a link between periodontal disease and Alzheimer's. So the best ways to improve your microbiome include regular checkups. If you can find a holistic or biological dentist, you're much better off. Of course, you want to do your brushing and your flossing, ideally water flossing, far more effective. Um, and you have to be mindful of what you put in your mouth, drinks, um, food. It's best to eat a nutrient-dense diet without a lot of refined sugar. You want to avoid toothpaste and mouthwashes in any oral care product that contains alcohol or all the harmful chemicals that most of them do contain. Thankfully today there's tons of non-toxic alternatives and it's really important to switch to the non-toxic brands. Oh my goodness, now I'm going to have to go and do an inventory of what I have in my bathroom to figure out if I have the right things or not. I have a feeling I'm going to have to go and hit the grocery store and just completely swap everything out tonight. I mean, you I know, did that. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's fairly common to find, for example, alcohol in, you know, mouthwash and things like that. Um, you see it all the time, and I'm sure it probably is in my bathroom right now. So, you know, talk to us more about that. You talk about four toxins that are in our home that are actually making us sick. What are those four toxins? Well, there are so many more than four. Because currently, the U.S. permits more than 85,000 chemicals in our food, water, and commercial products that we put on our skin, use to clean, store food in, wear, sleep on, grow crops with, and more. We are literally surrounded by toxins that have not been adequately tested for safety, many of which are banned in other countries. Phthalates is one of them. And what phthalates are, they're petroleum-based chemicals that make plastic soft and flexible. They are in personal care products, wood finish detergent, wood finishes, detergent, solvents, insecticides, building materials, meat and dairy products, and fast food. The chemicals soak through the containers that fast food and other food is stored in or transferred in and gets into the food, and then we ingest them. Another one is titanium dioxide. That's been classified as a group two carcinogen, and it's used in foods, creamers, candy, toothpaste, chewing gum, sunscreen, bronzers, makeup, soap, lotions, and even some medications and supplements. A third one is called parabens, and these are a group of chemicals that are preservatives used in cosmetics and pharmaceutical products, and they're used to prevent the growth of bacteria and mold and to extend the shelf life also to be avoided. Xenoestrogens are a fourth, 
but like I said, there are so many more. And these are synthetic or chemical compounds which mimic the effect of estrogen. They include the two previously mentioned parabens and phthalates, as well as many other chemicals. And they're found in food coloring, food preservatives, tap water, cleaning products, canned goods, paper money, nail polish, and many more. And they have the similar molecular makeup of estrogen, and they cause many people to become estrogen dominant, which just leads to a cascade of issues. Oh my goodness. That sounds like everything in my home. I'm going to need you to come over to my house in Nashville, just go through the whole home and be like, all right, this needs to go, this needs to go, and then give me replacements. I mean, I almost need like a cheat sheet from you that basically says, these are the things you need to look for, and then these are basically healthy replacements for all of those items, because I'm sure I violated just about every rule that you're Well, I did too, by yeah. the way. That's how I learned this. I learned this by making all the mistakes. Yeah. I didn't know it from the beginning. But by the way, the cheat sheet is my book. I have a, the ninth, my 19th chapter is a resource guide where I list all the different products and services and everything that I have vetted and I found to be non-toxic and sort of the conventional things that we were all using. Yeah. All right. Optimizing your health chapter 19. I guess that's where we're all going to get this information. And also, you also mentioned that there was a problem with the LED bulbs that all of us have been switching to in our homes. What's the problem with those LED bulbs? So in California, where I live, it's mandated that you can only buy LED bulbs because they're marketed and maybe they are, in fact, better they're better for the environment. They're more right. sustainable. And so everyone got on the bandwagon and there were laws passed. And so everyone has LED bulbs. And it's very hard to buy the kind of bulbs I want to buy. And the reason why I want the incandescent bulbs is because it has been found that these LED bulbs, which may in fact be better for the environment, are very bad for our biology. The spectrum of blue light enters into our eye, hits our retina, and it shuts off our own production of human growth hormone and melatonin. And part of the reason why so many people suffer with sleep issues and other issues is because we are exposed to the wrong spectrum of light at the wrong time. I have a whole chapter on light and blue light is fine in the daytime, but at night, once the sun goes down, you do not want to expose your body and your eyes to so much blue light. Oh my goodness. I got an LED bulb that's shining in my eyes right now. That's okay. It's off. daytime. <laughs> It's okay. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Time. All right. All right. We're good. <laughs> now, you know, so many of the students who are listening right now are taking various supplements. I mean, I see students taking supplements to get bigger in size if they want to add like muscle mass. For example, some want to diet, they want to get smaller, some want to get faster, some want to get healthier. I mean, you name it. There's supplements for everything on the market. It's literally like a whole aisle in the grocery store. So what problems do you have with the supplement industry? So many. <laughs> and yeah. I say that I take a ton of supplements and I have for years, but I've only recently evolved my philosophy on supplements because it used to be that I would read an article that would say something like, if you take this, you will improve your mitochondria. And I would think I want good mitochondria. I'm going to take that. But, it was, but then I did further research and I thought, whoa, there is a lot to know. I mean, first of all, the supplement industry, I think is a $200 billion industry. There's a very low barrier to entry. Anybody and everyone has entered the supplement industry because there is so much money to be made. And one of the first problems is that um, there's less quality control. I think something like 14 conglomerates have bought up all the small supplement companies. And many of these small companies started with a good mission to provide a pure product that wasn't filled with excipients and binders and fillers, these additional unnecessary chemicals to bulk up the capsule or to lower the cost. Um, but these big conglomerates are only worried about their bottom line and making money. And they don't care about the purity or the efficacy either. So that's one thing. You must source the brand very carefully. And the next thing is nobody talks about the synergistic effect of these supplements. And I had to learn the hard way. Because, like, for example, during COVID, everybody was promoting zinc, saying zinc is antiviral. Everybody should take zinc. But nobody was saying, but be careful because zinc 
and copper are two minerals that are synergistic and they must be in balance. And when you take way too much zinc, which a lot of people were doing, it will knock your copper levels out of balance. And that provides an issue. And then there's same with vitamin D, vitamin D and magnesium and vitamin A. Those are all synergistic. They work together. And when one is out of balance, the other ones will not be as effective. So it requires what I tell people, don't ever take any supplement or vitamin or mineral without first getting a baseline test. You need to know where you stand. I don't believe in multivitamins because most of them are not high quality. And most of them have sort of a de minimis quantity of each vitamin mineral, which is worthless at best. But if you're already sufficient in that area, totally unnecessary. And the term supplement kind of implies you only want to be taking something in which you are deficient. Really interesting. So is there a brand of supplement that you use? Because I know you take a couple of supplements yourself. I want to know which one is the good one. I take a bunch of them because I believe in them. I, you know, even though I say there are pitfalls, I yeah. think that we need them because the fact is, is that our soil has been degraded of minerals and nutrients. Our food supply is so tainted mm -hmm. and we're all under a lot of stress. And so they really provide a, a good value. If you do it correctly, there are a few doctor recommended brands. Mm -hmm. One I can say, one is called Pure. One okay. is Thorn. Okay. Um, uh, uh, design for health is another great one. All this is in the book, but I also personally, I vary according to what it is, you know, which supplement I'm taking for which. Okay. That's actually helpful because now I could go online. I can look up those brands and then substitute the supplements that I'm using for the good brands that we know are good. Um, all right. So all of this is very helpful. Now there's been a whole bunch of testing and health tracking devices that people can use to monitor their health. Are any of these uh, testing and health tracking devices or any of them any good? I love them. This is my favorite thing because okay. I love quantitative data. Yeah. And I believe in the adage that you cannot fix what you can't measure. If you don't know what's going on, you don't know what to do. It's random. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm a maniacal tester and tracker. I really am. I don't expect other people to be quite so obsessive, but I find it fascinating. In terms of testing, you can test everything. You know, your blood, your, your mineral deficiencies, you name it, you can test it. But the tracking devices, I have two favorites that I love to talk about. The first is the Aura Ring, which I have on now. And this is a very clever device that comes out of Finland. And it's a sleep tracking at device, but does many, many things. Um, you pair it with your phone. In the morning when you wake up, you can learn so many metrics about your sleep, your heart rate, you know, your resting heart rate during your sleep, how much REM sleep you had, how much deep sleep you had, what your respiratory rate is, your heart rate variab variability, which is a metric for stress, which is very important. Um, it also tracks movement and activity, but not as well i prefer i think the sleep metrics are great and i think they're on their fifth edition and they keep improving it professional basketball teams use them i mean they advertise on cnbc it's really a great product now is it 100 percent accurate probably not but it's better than no knowledge um and my second device that i love is something called a continuous glucose monitor. Now, this is a device that was designed for people with diabetes, diabetes one or diabetes two. But I think it has great utility for everybody. And I'm convinced that sometime in the future, although I don't know when, everyone's gonna have one. Because the amount of information that you get is so incredibly valuable that everybody should know this information. What they do, is they tell you how your body reacts to not only the food that you eat, the things that you drink, but your sleep and your stress, because all these affect glucose. And glucose spikes have been implicated in all diseases. And you do not want to have a lot of glucose spikes. And you may not know, because we're all so different genetically and biochemically, what one person can eat and have no response to can be completely different from the next person, even among families. So seemingly benign foods like a banana or a carrot, or maybe even popcorn, one person can eat those and not spike their glucose. And the next person can eat them and their glucose can go sky high. 
And it's these continuous spikes that are really bad for us. So it's really good information to gather. So you can think, maybe you don't have to eliminate bananas altogether if you spike them, but there are tricks that you can do. Like you can add nut butter to your banana. And what that'll do is that'll slow the glucose spike. And little things like that, there's food pairing and timing and all these hacks that one can do to reduce your glucose spikes, which everyone needs to do. That's great information. I know my dad is diabetic, so I'm going to have to get him going with that. And the ring sounds fantastic. I mean, to get all this information on all of my sleep patterns, I think this is helpful. That way I know if I'm actually getting good sleep or not, or what's going on and what changes I need to make in order to encourage better sleep. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. I love all of that information. And, you know, the other thing I was thinking about too, with, you know, what it is that you do, you talk about being your own health advocate. And I really like that conversation, but, you know, I, I'm a little bit confused. I mean, aren't doctors supposed to be our health advocate? Well, yes, they are supposed to be. And perhaps at one time in the distant past, they were, but, you know, it's much different today. And, and the reason it's different, there are many reasons. I mean, part of it is if the health insurance companies squeeze the doctors on the time that they can allocate to each patient, something like 10 to 15 minutes. Most of the time their heads are buried in their electronic health records. They barely do vis visual exams anymore, which used to be a big component of an exam. And the biggest thing they seem to ignore is they don't acknowledge that each one of us, as I previously said, is so different genetically and biochemically. And they're administering one size fits all healthcare which is the nature of our healthcare system. And it's not helpful at all because we're too different. And nobody knows your body's response better than you do. You know if you react poorly to something or you'll get to know. The doctor doesn't know that. And so at the very least, I encourage people to collaborate with their doctor. And if they can, do their own due diligence, do further research. Get a hold of your health because there's nothing more important and you don't want to wait until you're sick. You want to do it before you get there. Yeah, that's really great advice. And, you know, what I found is it just seems like every doctor is a specialist in a particular area and they just have blinders on to the rest of your body, even though it's all connected, obviously. Um, and so nobody really is just taking firm control of you holistically and to look at the big picture. Like everyone's just like, OK, I'm a kidney doctor. That's all I'm going to look at and not looking at all of the other organs that are connected there. Um, so, yeah, just really fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, I really That's spot that. on too. I've had more discussions with doctors saying, you know, I'm not just this organ. Right. Everything artistically, everything does. And when they address just one thing, they do it oftentimes at the disadvantage of the rest biology. Now, yeah. you know, if you have, I, I always say that if you're in a car accident, or you feel a broke bone or an acute infection, you want to go to an allopathic conventionally trained doctor. That's what they're good at. But it's these chronic ailments, which are increasing exponentially, that they're not well equipped to handle. Yeah, I like that a lot. You know, you were talking about the, the ring and getting sleep. And so I wanted to go back to that for a second, because I'm wondering how can poor sleep affect both your appetite and also your metabolism? So sleep is critically important. It's really one of the very main pillars. And when your sleep is disordered, you can't really get anything else in perfect order or optimize. But to answer your question specifically, sleep affects, among many other things, our hormone balance. In particular, disordered sleep affects the hormones which regulate our appetite and our metabolism. Ghrelin is a hormone that is known as the hunger hormone. And leptin is another hormone known as the satiety hormone. It tells you that you're full and to stop eating. When you have lack of sleep, you increase the production of ghrelin and you decrease the production of leptin. And additionally, insufficient sleep will also increase the release of stress hormones like cortisol. And that will increase or decrease rather your insulin sensitivity, which regulates our blood sugar and is implicated in everything. 
Wow, that's fascinating stuff. And this is why I keep telling the college students, you're not getting enough sleep. I mean, every time I see these college students on college campuses, they are dragging. I mean, I can tell that they probably have had four or five hours of sleep a night. They're just not sleeping enough. And they're exhausted all the time. And I'm like, this is not good for you. You can't do this for four years. Like, this is not okay. Oh. It's so true. And the thing is, when you're young, when you're in college, you tend to delay the symptoms and you can get away with a lot when you're young because you're more resilient. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it starts building the blocks for bad things to come later on. So even though you may not feel it now, when you're 18 to 21, mm -hmm. you think you can get away with it, you're setting yourself up for some bad stuff in the future. Yeah, I'm with you there. I really, really like this. This has all been great. Now, you know, you've got me thinking about food now. Um, and so, you know, we do love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. And I was just booked to go out to speak at USC um, in Ooh. another week. So I know I'm going to be out in LA. I need to know where do you go for healthy food in LA? Well, it's hard. I mean, there are more places that are popping up. Um, unfortunately, I have read so much about food and nutrition that whenever I go to a restaurant, I always question, are they using bad seed oils? Bad seed oils is something that everyone should know about. And most restaurants don't know about it. Canola oil has been marketed as a wonderful oil to use. And I have a feeling some great restaurants use it unwittingly, not in an evil way, but because they don't know any better. And the reality is it's been processed in a way it's an industrialized product and it's very bad for us because it increases our omega-6 to our omega-3 ratio. And that's pro-inflammatory. So I, I go, I try to, I'm trying to think if I can think of any names of restaurants. USC is rather far from where I live. As you mm -hmm. probably know, LA is so spread out. Yeah, so spread. Um, and you know, that's a good 45 minute drive. So I don't often eat there, but I know that in down, it's near to downtown LA and there's so many wonderful restaurants that are emerging in downtown because the whole area has been quite gentrified. I'm sorry that I can't give you any names of restaurants. That's I could right. look for them and send them to you. Emily, I'm gonna come knock on your door and you're just gonna have to make me a great meal at home because it sounds like you know exactly what to cook with. And you know, these other restaurants, I mean, they need to be coming to you for advice. They need to read your book. They do. They do. I'd love to send you a book. If you give me your address, I'll send one to you. <laughs> That's a deal. Absolutely. I need a copy of that book because I can tell I've got all the wrong things in my house. I need to replace everything and just get all new stuff. So I'm definitely going to get you my address. So, all right. So if our students, if they want to connect with you, if they want to buy your book, so that way they make sure they have all the healthy stuff in their home. Maybe they want to invite you in as a speaker on their campus at USC or, or any other campus. Where should they go to connect with you? Well, I have a website, which is called Emily Gold Beers. Actually, all my social media is not very cleverly titled Emily Gold Beers, just to make it easy to remember my Instagram, my LinkedIn, my Facebook, and my website. My book is available on Amazon and online, at all booksellers. I love it. All right. The book is called Optimizing Your Health. So go and pick up that book. I'm going to be reading chapter 19 as soon as Emily sends that over to my house. And then I'm going to have a full report for all of our listeners. So that way they know all the great information they're going to find in your book. I absolutely love this. This has been great, Emily. Thank you so much for sharing all this information with our listeners. Thank you, Michael. I enjoyed it too. I appreciate the opportunity. and I wish everybody optimal health. Fantastic. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this interview with Emily, make sure that you like it. Make sure that you share it with other students on campus, on social media, wherever other students are hanging out. And we look forward to seeing you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us and we will see you next time.